Okay, welcome to uh, Developmental Psychology, Psych 236. Um, it is week five. Today we're covering uh, early childhood, so ages two to six, and we're covering cognitive development. Let's get to that. We're gonna talk about all these things. We're gonna you know, continue talking about Piaget's theory, so we're gonna talk about uh, theories of learning. Uh, we're also going to introduce another theory, Bygotsky's theory of learning. We'll talk about something called theory of mind, language, and early education. Okay, because these are, well, this, it's also known as the play years, but it's also when kids usually start school, whether it's preschool, kindergarten, when they're about six years old, they start first grade. So yes, we'll talk about early education. So let's get started and let's talk about these theories of learning. Okay. Um, we started talking about Piaget's theory the last time we talked about cognitive development, but that was birth to about two years of age. Now we're talking about two to six years of age. So now we're talking about uh, we're gonna we're talking we're gonna talk about Piaget's second stage of development. So it's it's called the pre-operational period or the period of pre-operational thought. So ages two to six. Okay, uh, what's happening during this time? This is a theory of learning. According to Piaget, children during this time, yes, they are developing language skills, okay? And they started that even earlier, but now they get, they're getting a lot better at language, a lot better at talking. And even when they start school, they learn how to write their names, they learn their letters, all kinds of things like that. Symbolic thought develops, symbolic thought. Language is also, is also symbolic thought. So are learning your numbers, okay? And other things we're gonna talk about that relate to symbolic thought. Okay, um, but there are some problems during this time and we mostly focus on the deficits when it comes to talking about Piaget's theory of, uh, of development. So some problems, some deficits, uh, problems that children tend to have during this time. Uh, one problem is centration. Centration means let's do with the center. So children tend to center on things, on one aspect of the problem during this period. Okay, <clears throat> like they might learn about cats, right? So a cat, you know, is a cat and a lion cannot be a cat because cats are like the cat they have at home. That's that pet cat. A lion cannot be a cat. So centration causes problems with logic, okay? Uh, because they focus on some things and ignore other things. Okay, yes, a lion is bigger than a normal house cat, but it's still a cat. Okay, that's a problem with centration. Centration leads to other problems as well. It's called the pre-operational period, the period of pre-operational thought, because pre-operational means that this is a time when they have not yet uh, developed uh, logic that well. They, they cannot think very well about things yet, logically about things. So they have some problems. One of those is centration. They focus on one problem, on one aspect of the problem, ignore other things, and that leads to errors in logic. Centration will become a little bit more clear when we talk about other things uh, like conservation that they have a big problem with. It'll make uh, problems with centration very clear, okay? Now, there's also a problem with egocentrism. Ch children during this, this age are very egocentric, okay? And the problem is that they can't really consider somebody else's point of view, at least at the beginning of the stage. Closer to age six, yes, they can, but Regardless, during this period of time, during this four years, children are very egocentric. They're very selfish, very self-centered. They think about themselves to the exclusion of other people. Eventually, they become able to think about others and consider other people's point of view, but they're still very egocentric in their thinking. It's still all about them. So if you ask a child during the pre-operational stage, right, uh, you know, you tell a child, hey, you know, uh, you know little Jimmy has just... Uh, had an accident, he fell off his bike and he scraped his knee, right? What shall we do for Jimmy to make him feel better? Well, we say, well, let's, you know, give Jimmy a teddy bear. I know that's what, you know, the, the child is thinking something like, well, that's what would make me feel better. So let's give Jimmy a teddy bear. Or let's say it was an adult that fell and scraped his knee, right? And the child will still say something like, well, let's, let's give uh, this person a teddy bear to make them feel better, right? They're thinking about what it would be like for them, not necessarily what it's like for somebody else. Or say, mommy's birthday is coming up. What should we give mommy for her birthday? 
the child being able to think about his or her own perspective only or being very self-centered, very egocentric, will say, well, let's get mommy a doll, right? Because it's a little girl say, mommy would like a doll. That's what they would like, not what mommy would like. So they're very egocentric. It doesn't mean they're necessarily bad. They're just not very good about thinking about what other people want and other people's needs. Okay. There's also a focus on appearance. Okay. When they see something and it looks a certain way, it must mean that that is that it has to do with what it is. So if you dress up like as the Yeti there, you dress up in a costume, you can really scare them during this time. Because if you look like some big scary monster, to them, you are a big scary monster. And you'll really scare them really bad. And then you have to take off the costume or the mask really quick and say, no, it's just daddy, don't, don't cry, right? And you have to try to calm them down and help them understand. So there's this focus on appearance that also relates to like hairstyles and the way you dress and things like that. If you, heart, if you have short hair, you know, <clears throat> if you have short hair uh, to children at this age, it indicates that you are a boy because boys have short hair, but maybe you're a girl with short hair. Or if you dress like a boy, right, then you must be a boy and maybe you're a girl. But they focus on things, uh, they focus on, on the appearance a lot and it leads to errors, right? It's all a problem with centration and egocentrism where they focus on certain things and ignore other things and it leads to errors in logic. Let's keep going because I spend way too much time on that slide than I should have. There's other issues and this is kind of cute. Children also have suffer from something, from something called am animism during this time, animism, like animation, right? Animism. So they believe that natural objects or that things are actually alive, that their teddy bear is alive, their tricycle is alive, you know, and they might have imaginary friends, okay? They can hold rational and magical ideas, right? I mean, they can believe in things that are just magical or just aren't possible, okay? They might believe something like, or they might say something like, the sun is sad today because it's cloudy and he can't shine. Or my tricycle is mad at me. It made me fall and scrape my knee. So they believe in magical things, you know, and, uh, you know, that their toys have feelings um, or that they, they might have an imaginary friend or something like that. All this is normal during this time. My son has a teddy bear, big teddy bear that, uh, you know, it, he puts a dress on it. So the teddy bear is wearing a dress, a pink dress. And he calls his teddy bear Juliana, which is a girl that he likes. And it's a girl from uh, Kids Bop. Okay. So to him, his teddy bear is alive and he's, her name is Juliana and he loves his teddy bear and he goes everywhere with it. And to him, this teddy bear has feelings and loves him back. Okay. Other uh, issues um, during this time, other deficits, static reasoning, which means that reasoning only of one kind leads to problems. Okay. They assume that the world doesn't change. That's static reasoning, okay? Things stay the same, and that's not the case, okay? So they believe that teachers only teach. Teachers don't shop. They don't dance. They don't have normal lives. Teachers are just teachers, okay? So they just believe that things are a certain way, okay? And they can't be any different. And that's, you know, and that's a, a thing that they see with teachers. And they're often surprised you know, to see their teacher outside of school, shopping somewhere, or maybe at a get together or a barbecue or something like that, if they should run into their teacher. It's like, but you're my teacher, you're, don't you, you're supposed to be at school, right? Like, no, they don't live in school, okay? Uh, and even kindergartners can sometimes be surprised, uh, you know, when they walk into the classroom and the teacher's showing the students around, said, look, here are the toys, here's all these other things, here are the books, and there was one day, a true story, one little kid asked, where's the bed? Where does the teacher sleep, right? The teacher doesn't live in the classroom. That's not all they are, right? There are also other things and they do other things, but that's a problem with static reasoning. Irreversibility is also a problem. They believe that things cannot be undone. They can't be reversed. So if you don't like lettuce and the lettuce happens to be on their hamburger, you can't just remove it. If the hamburger is ruined, it's contaminated. Or if they stain their shirt, it's like the shirt is ruined. It needs to be thrown away. You know, never mind the fact that you can clean it and get rid of the stain. They think things cannot be reversed. And that's a problem with logic. Another problem with logic is the problem with conservation. Conservation is the idea that the amount of something is unaffected by changes in its appearance. So I'll have to explain this on the next slide. But the fact that something can look different and then it's still, that it's still the same, they don't understand things like that. And that's a problem with conservation. 
Two to six year olds kind of lack this, okay? So here's a slide that shows, helps you understand this. Some images here. So the first one is volume, okay? Top row there, conservation of top row with the images, conservation of volume. Show them two glasses of liquid. They're filled to the same height. And you ask the child, are these the same? Do these have the same amount or are they different? The child will say, they're the same. But if you take, the top, if you take one glass and you pour, pour it into a taller, thinner glass, so now you have an image like the one in the middle, the blue one there, and you ask them, now or do, are they, do they have the same amount or is one, does one have more? The child will say that the taller one has more. It's taller, it, raises to, it, it, it basically goes to a higher level, so it must have more liquid in it. That's a problem with conservation. It's actually the same amount. They saw the same amount go from one glass to the other, but they focus on one thing. They, they center on the height of the glass, ignore the width, and that leads to a problem with logic, problem with conservation. Similar thing with number. They understand those two rows of pennies there have the same number of pennies. And the child may even be able to count. But if you take one row of pennies and you stretch it out a little bit, the top one, and you do this right in front of the child. And, you, and then you ask the child, do these rows of pennies have the same amount or does one have more? The child will look at it closely and they'll say the top row has more pennies, even though they're the same. Similar thing with the balls of clay. They understand those two balls of clay have the same amount of clay. If you take one and you smash it, stretch it out, they'll think that the longer one now has more clay, even though you did this in front of them. They, and they should know it's the same amount. Two sticks equal length. They understand they're equal length move one a little bit to the right so it sticks out a little bit more, they'll think that one is longer. Those are problems with logic. Those are, problem, those are errors, right, uh, that they commit. They don't yet understand conservation. That's why it's called the pre-operational period. Pre means before, so they can't yet operate on their environment. They don't yet understand even the logical aspects of physical things. Let's keep going. Let's talk about another theory. Uh, Vygotsky. Uh, Vygotsky had a theory. Um, Vygotsky uh, had a theory that basically says that children, the way they learn is as a, apprentices. Okay, when you when you go through an apprenticeship, what happens is you have an older, more experienced member, right, and then the younger person who is new, and the younger person learns from the older person, just like you learn, you know, basically, uh, you know, plumbing or welding or whatever it is, uh, you learn from a more skilled person, okay? And according to Vygotsky, this is how we learn. This is how we learn language. This is how we learn things in general. It's like an apprenticeship, right? Children learn from older, more advanced members of society. So ch children's learning, according to Vygotsky, is embedded into a social context, right? They learn as being part of a group, part, part of be, as part of, uh, of a culture, part of, an, uh, a, part of a uh, society. They ask questions about how machines work, why the weather changes, all sorts of things. And they learn from older people. They learn from more older, more knowledgeable members. They learn through what's called an apprenticeship, right? That learning is directed by an older, more skilled member of the culture. That could be a teacher, a parent, an older sibling. That's how we learn according to Vygotsky. But he said more than that, okay? He says children learn best. Children learn through what's called, what he called guided participation right, where the older member, the older person guides the person step by step and helps them learn things. And uh, something important for learning, he called scaffolding. Scaffolding is what you see um, when, some, when they're building a house or a, new, or a building, and it's those things um, like those bars that you see on the side with those planks of wood that they can step on so they can reach the higher level of the house or level of the building, right? to build the building. Um, according to uh, Vygotsky, scaffolding also works, on a, also works for learning, where you, uh, you basically create things for children or you uh, include things to help them get to the ne next step, to help them learn the next part. Like for instance, you know, like when they're learning their letters, right? Uh, they learn first, you know, to, you know, to do, to, when they're just learning how to, how to, let's say, how to make the letters, they learn first by tracing, let's say, the letters, you know, when there's little dots, that they follow little dots and they trace. And then later, and, um, you know, and they also have line paper that tells them to stay between the lines. Okay, and then later on, the lines go, the little dotted lines go away, 
and then they just trace it within that. And then later on, they can even trace it, you know, carefully do the letters really well without having any lines. So it's scaffolding. It's just things that are provided to make things easier, to guide them to the next step. So it's guided learning. It's temporary support in which the teacher draws the learner into what's called the zone of proximal development. The zone of proximal development, that is where learning takes place. That is where, where you have the best form of learning. The zone of proximal development are, is basically refers to skills, cognitive skills and physical skills, but skills that a person can exercise, that a person can, can acquire, but only with assistance. They can't yet do it independently. They can't do it on their own. It is things that they can do with some assistance. So there are things that children can do on their own without any assistance. And there are things that the children cannot do. Those are things outside the zone of proximal development. And then there are things that the child can do, can do if the child is given some help. That is the zone of proximal development. That is, a, that is the level that you want to target for children when you're trying to teach them as a teacher or as a parent. Okay, you want to get them to the next step. So you want to get them to something they can't yet do by themselves, but they can do it with some help. And if you help them, eventually they learn to do it on their own. Here's a, um, I guess you call this a Venn diagram, you know, kind of a type of graph that shows you about the zone of proximal development. So we have there in, I guess that's purple or burgundy, that's independent problem solving. That is what the children can do on their own. They don't need any help. And then you have the stuff in, uh, I guess, the beige there, the light brown, or the very light brown, the beige. That is the stuff that they, that's outside their development. That's the stuff they cannot do on their own. Okay, that's the stuff. Now, that's the stuff they can't, they can't yet do. Even if you help them, they can't do it. Okay, that's that type of problem solving. That's out of their zone. And then there's the stuff in the middle. The stuff they cannot do by themselves but they can do it with some help. That's the zone of proximal development. That is what you want to target. That is where learning takes place. That is where ch children learn best. You don't want to make things too hard for them or they can't do it even with help. That's the stuff in beige. You don't want to make things too easy because they can do it on their own. They're not really learning. They already know how to do that. You have to target the stuff in the middle, the stuff they can't do, but they can do it if you help them, okay? And there's a video there I'm not gonna show you because it doesn't work very well in Zoom. You can look at it on your own. That's Vygotsky's theory. And Vygotsky's theory, by the way, is underdeveloped. Uh, it's not complete, it, the theory is not complete. And that's because Vygotsky died. You know, he was a Russian and uh, I think he was, if I remember correctly, I think he was recruited into the war. I forget which war it was. It was World War I or it might've been World War II or something like that. And he was, I think he was just killed in action. Okay, so he, he you know, and. He was a very productive, you know, uh, very good scientist, and he left behind some unfinished work, and his theory was unfinished. But he, you know, a bunch of publications, a bunch of things that he wrote about how children learn, which was very uh, groundbreaking at the time. People were not thinking in those ways. Let's talk about something else related to learning, related to cognitive development, and that is the theory of mind. Remember how I said that children often are very egocentric, and they only think about their own point of view? That is related to theory of mind. Theory of mind is the ability for children to understand how other people think, to predict what goes on in another person's mind. So it's not enough that they understand what they're thinking, they also have to be able to think about other people's thinking. What is somebody else thinking? What is happening for them? They need to be able to imagine that, think about that. Children must realize that other people are not necessarily thinking the same things they are. Other people are different, they have their own thoughts. When children begin to understand how other people think, or the other people have their own thoughts and they begin to understand what somebody must be thinking or feeling, that's when they acquire theory of mind. It's acquired by about age four on average. And this helps them consider somebody else's point of view, to think of some, from somebody else's perspective, okay? So children try to understand, when they develop theory of mind, they try to understand why someone is angry. They may not be angry, but why is that other person angry? Try to understand when someone will be generous, when someone is likely to say yes when they ask for a dollar or ask for a popsicle or something like that. When mommy will say yes to that, right? Maybe they understand or they, or they learn that when mommy's in a good mood, when mommy is smiling, that means that she's happier and then she's more likely to say yes. 
or how to avoid the, you know, their aunt's kiss. Their aunt's gonna come in and try to give them a big kiss and they don't like that. They think it's gross and they start thinking about what their aunt must be thinking, right? When she walks in the door, she's gonna be thinking about something and they try to think about those things so they can avoid her. So by three to six children realize that what people think may not represent reality, that people, uh, people can be thinking about something else uh, that is not actually what is happening in real life. And, and this also means that people can be fooled or deceived. The people may be thinking one thing, but there may be something else going on that's also related to theory of mind. So let me explain with this example over here, an example that, that uh, helps you understand theory of mind. So three-year-olds, for instance, confuse belief with reality. You could ask a three-year-old you know, about uh, a candy box. So you show a three-year-old a candy box, and it's not necessarily like the picture over here, but that's a box of candy. But you have a box of candy and the box is sealed, okay? They can't see through it, okay? It hasn't been opened yet. And on the box, it says candy, okay? And the adult shows the candy box to the three-year-old and the adult asks, what is inside? The, you know, the child sees that it says candy or and he maybe has pictures of candy. So the child says candy, okay? And the adult says, let's open the box and find out. And then the child says, oh, holy moly, pencils. There's pencils in the box, not candy. So the child was fooled, right? The reality, what they were thinking was not necessarily what was happening. And the adult says, before we open the box, what did you think was inside? The child says, pencils. And we know it's not true, right? No, the child was thinking there was candy in the box, but the child says pencils, because the child doesn't even understand that what they're thinking may not represent reality. And then, well, I forgot to put the word adult there, but the adult then asks, Nikki, a friend has not seen the box. What do you think Nikki will think is in the box when she sees it? The correct answer, of course, is that Nikki will think there's candy in the box, when in reality there's pencils. But the child says, pencils. Nikki will think there's pencils in the box. That means the child has not yet acquired theory of mind. The child doesn't understand that just like her, Nikki will look at the box and will think there's candy in it, when in reality there are pencils in it. If the child had theory of mind, the child will be able to understand like just how I was fooled, this person will also be fooled into thinking something else, which means that they can think about what somebody else is thinking. So there's a couple of videos there you guys can watch on your own about theory of mind to help you understand that. But hopefully it's clear from this example. Let's keep going. Now, what influences theory of mind? Okay, well, one thing is the maturation of the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, remember, is that front part of the brain that allows you to be self-aware, right, to focus, to control your emotions, right? That kind of stuff. Well, it turns out it also helps with theory of mind. It helps you understand what somebody else must be thinking. Social interaction also helps, especially mother-child interactions. If you talk to your children and you try to help them understand what other people are thinking, you know, and you help, you have, uh, you know, you have some good conversations, right? That involve thoughts and wishes, you know, what would she like? What would you like? That kind of stuff. It promotes language development and also development of theory of mind. Having an older brother and sister also helps because when you have an older brother or sister, right, you have to think about what they're thinking about. And what they are thinking is probably different from what you're thinking. They're older, they are more advanced in their development, and you have to try to understand what they might be thinking. It helps you think about somebody else when you have an older brother or sister. Having a sibling will help, okay? Now let's talk about language development in general, okay? Uh, how does language develop during this time? It, we are talking about cognitive development after all. So now let's talk about language as a separate thing. So ages two to six, language develops very rapidly, okay? Um, just to review some things uh, or to tell you some things, uh, when it comes to language <clears throat> in the past, uh, they thought that language had a, what we call a critical period, right, of language development. So a critical period is the only time when language can be mastered. If language is a, has a critical period, that means it's the only time you can learn it or you can master it. And the best time, it, and it's the best time for learning a second or third language. It's not quite accurate. It turns out that people can master another language even after early childhood. People can master a second language after puberty. It's harder, but they can still do it. 
So it's not so much of a critical period. A critical period is the only time they can master it. For language, it's more of a sensitive period, right? Which means it's the time when vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation is more easily learned. It's easier to learn a language during, from ages two to six, but it can still happen at a later time. So it's more of a sensitive period. You need to know the difference between those. So let's talk about what happens with language during this time. So like I said, language develops very rapidly during this time. Vocabulary expands rapidly, okay? And there's large variations with, with different children, by the way. Some of them are very good at language. Uh, girls, for instance, are usually better at language than boys. They acquire it more, fa uh, more quickly. But that doesn't mean every girl is going to be amazing at language and that every boy is going to be bad. It's just there, there are averages. But on average, girls acquire language faster, okay? So their vocabulary might expand from 100 to 2,000 words, you know, uh, very quickly at, at age two, right? They might know 100 to 2,000 words, depending on where your child is. Um, 2,000 would be very advanced, but, you know, some of them might know 100 words or something like that. Um, and then to about maybe 5,000 or 30,000 by age six. So a huge growth of language, just a huge spurt, okay? Uh, Two-year-olds can, can learn up like 10 words per day without even trying, by the way, okay? It's just part of, it's just as they, you know, as they experience things, as they hear things in TV or whatever it is, they learn language very, very rapidly. And one thing that's been mentioned that might be helping them acquire language so quickly is called fast mapping. It's acquire, aware of a, a way of acquiring new words by mentally placing them into categories, into known categories. They can learn the word tiger very easily when they see a tiger and they say, well, it's an animal, right? It goes into the category animal and it goes into the category big cat, you know, which already has the word that they already know in their lion. So they can learn a whole, you know, about, you know, they can learn about a whole bunch of different big cats. This is a leopard, this is a lion, this is a cheetah, you know, uh, a tiger, whatever it is, a house cat. And they can learn all those words very easily just by thinking about the category big cats or cats, okay? So they learn vocabulary very, very quickly. It can't be that they're just being rewarded for all those things, for, for, for all those words. They're mentally placing them into categories and acquiring the language very, very quickly. Um, by age three, their use of grammar rules for language is actually impressive. By age three, when they talk, they know to place the subject before the verb. So they know that it's appropriate, at least in English, to say the cat runs. Okay, the subject comes before the verb. By the way, in Spanish, it's different. Wait, no. Okay, no, for, for subject for the verb, it, uh, never mind, it's just think about English, okay? I know English better than Spanish, believe it or not, but the cat runs, okay? So that's the correct way of saying it. And to place the adjective before the noun, like wet dog, they say things, they say things properly. In Spanish, it's the opposite, it's perro mojado, okay? In Spanish, it's the, the rules are reversed when it comes to that, okay? They use past, present, and future tense uh, correctly, okay? So by this time, they're a lot better at grammar. Remember, they had a lot of problems before this. Uh, there's some problems that do remain. They have problems. Uh, at age three, they show problems with over-regularization or, or over-regulation when they apply the rules of grammar unnecessarily. So they learn that Usually, when you put an S after the end of a word, it means that there's more, like cat, right? You add an S, then there's cats. There's more than one. But the rule doesn't always apply. So they will create words, or they will say words that are wrong. They'll say that there's foots. There's no such thing as foots, right? The so you have one foot, or you have two feet. It's feet. But they try to say foots. Just add an S, just like a lot of the other words. Or tooths. There's no such thing as tooths. It is teeth, that's the plural, or sheeps. One sheep, right? Or many sheep, the word remains the same. Or mouses, when it's mice, right? It's actually not their fault. The English language is actually a weird language where sometimes it follows some rules and sometimes the rules are different for different words. And the reason for that is that English is actually a language made up of a whole bunch of other languages. English has German in it. It has French, it has Spanish. It's actually a language made up of a whole bunch of other languages. And it doesn't always follow the same rules. Yeah, the word kernel, right? It's a French word, kernel. Yeah, 
try to spell that word kernel. If you've never seen it before, you're going to spell it wrong. It looks completely different than how you say it. Okay, and that's because it's a French word and it doesn't follow the, this rule necessarily. Or it, I mean, it doesn't, follow always, it doesn't always follow the same rules. Other problems with language, children do have problems uh, with comparisons, things that imply comparisons. Like what, what does it mean to be tall or short? What is near, far, high, low, deep, shallow? Those things imply comparisons. They have to understand those things in context. So a child might say, you know, that he's tall, when in reality he's short. But that's because, you know, he may not know what tall really is because he doesn't understand context. So children don't always know, right, when you tell them, hey, you know, get me the big one or the tall one or whatever it is, or that's really far and it's really not, okay? It's just that they don't understand the context. You need more experience to understand what these words really mean, okay? The words like here or there, you have to understand the context, right? Because other otherwise, they're kind of meaningless. Yesterday, tomorrow, what does tomorrow mean? Is it tomorrow yet? Come here, go there. It can be confusing for them, at least at the beginning of this stage, because they don't really understand what you mean. Because those that implies a comparison. Joe, you have to point. Come here, right? Or go there, right? Because they, otherwise, they don't understand. Um, more about language. What about being bilingual? Is it a good thing to be bilingual, to learn more than one language at the same time? Okay. Children can learn a second language during the play years, right? Remember, it's easier to learn language during this time. Being bilingual, bilingualism has advantages and disadvantages. If you are bilingual, uh, you're less egocentric when it comes to understanding language. So it actually helps you develop theory of mind quicker because you actually have to think about how somebody else would say something, somebody from another country or somebody who speaks a different language, you have to place yourself in somebody else's shoe, so to speak. So it helps you become less egocentric and think about what other people are thinking, right? Consider somebody else's point of view uh, sooner than you otherwise would. Um, it has disadvantages when you are bilingual. Well, you're slower in both languages. Reading comprehension is slower. Um, then if you, just, if you just know one language, then you'll be faster in that language than you would be if you knew two languages. So it does slow you down a little bit because your mind kind of has to shift and adjust and, uh, well, it's easier if, if your brain is just wired for one language. It's faster. There's also a language shift. Sometimes uh, kids can become more fluent in the new language. You know, like if a, children, a child, for instance, uh, you know, has uh, Spanish-speaking parents and they learn Spanish first at home and then they go to school and they learn English with their friends and at school and uh, eventually they may become so fluent in English uh, that they are, they're actually better at it uh, than Spanish because they've received no education in Spanish other than what they've heard, but all their education is in English. So they can become better at the new language. Children will often refuse to speak their native language due to the status of the language, right? That English is the high status language. And if you don't know how to speak English, you know, they might think that there's something wrong with you and they may refuse to speak their native language. And there are some that actually forget their native language and some that may never learn their native language that their parents may not teach them because they think it's a bad thing to learn the native language that in this country we speak English and that's the only thing you should speak. And that's part of, by the way, a uh, part of being prejudiced and racist, okay? Um, no language is better than another language, okay? If you're a balanced bilingual, uh, that means you can speak both languages equally well without the hint of another. You don't have an accent in either language. And there are many people who are like that. And, you, and children can learn two, three languages at the same time. It just depends on where they're growing up and how they're growing up, you know? If they have Spanish speaking parents, but they're also going to school, in, in the US and they're learning English or in Europe, even, even more so, you know, where there's a lot of countries right next to each other. And now you have the European Union and, and there's French and Spanish and English and German and all these different languages. Oh, these people interacting and moving freely about the European Union, by the way, and they encounter people who learn a lot, who know a lot of different languages. And in Europe, you're considered like illiterate if you don't know at least like three languages. They look down upon you. It's like, what's wrong with you? You only know one language the heck is wrong with you? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and there are a lot of people actually who can speak multiple languages equally well. But usually, I mean, usually you mean you're better on one language than the other, the one you started with. 
Now let's talk about uh, early education. Two to six years of age is when a lot of children actually start uh, school. Maybe you put them in, um, in, uh, in preschool or maybe you start them with kinder, right? It's better if they start earlier with preschool, okay? Uh, but some will start at kinder. Or if you're like me, I started school in the first grade, right? Because I, you know, very poor, grew up in a third world country. I came to this country. My mother brought me here as a young child. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I was already like six years old. So I went right to first grade. And of course, I, went, I was behind. I had no formal education before that. And I came in and uh, I advanced very quickly. Within one year, I knew the language. I was speaking English fluently. Okay, so children can learn very quickly. And then eventually I, I got a lot better, okay? Um, but the thing is early education, whether it's preschool or kindergarten, how, you know, how does that work and what kind of programs are there? What kind of schools are there? We'll talk about child-centered programs first and then we'll talk about other types of programs, which is really what happens here in the US, which is not so good, okay? Uh, early education is not very good. Education here in the US, it just isn't very good, period, okay? Um, but it depends on what kind of school you, you attend, okay? Some schools are better than others and they take different approaches. Um, child-centered programs, there are schools that take a child-centered approach. And these are usually schools that are private or other schools that you have to pay for. But they stress the children's development and growth, okay? The child's need to explore, right? They don't just teach the child how to follow directions and how to stay in line and raise your hand before you talk. And those are other types of programs. That's really what happens here. But these kind of programs, they stress the, ch the child's need, unique need for exploration and growth and things like that. So they encourage children to discover the ideas at their own pace, to learn at their own pace, okay? And it includes other things that are, you know, more creative that, you know, uh, dress up clothing, art supplies, blocks, many different toys, so a lot of enrichment, right? A lot of things. It's not just somebody talking to them. Like we're doing now, by the way, this is called lecturing. You don't lecture to children. This approach doesn't work very well for children. We do it in college because we have to cover a whole bunch of different material in like 16 weeks, actually less than that because of all the exams. Uh, but you can't do that with children. If you try to teach children by lecturing to them, they're not gonna learn very well, okay? They're not gonna learn very much. They, so they encourage children actually doing things and playing with things. It's part of their development, right? And ch encourage children to artistic expression, right? For them to use their artistic tendencies, right? Children love to draw and they love to play and create, right? And they also, uh, they also have children learn from other children. Children can learn from older, more experienced children, right? That's the Vygotsky model, the guided participation. Now they also learn from teachers as well, but uh, you'd be surprised how eager other children are to show another child how to do something or to work with other children. Children can also learn from others. And it's more interesting for them when they learn from their you know, from a classmate than the teacher because they get to interact and they get to, you know, they get to make friends. Okay, that's a child-centered program. And here's one example of a child-centered program, uh, Montessori schools. And these are, like I said, schools that are usually private that you have to pay for, right? So they give children, you know, structured individualized projects. So projects that are tailored to their own needs, their own abilities, right? And they give the children a sense of pride and accomplishment. They'll put like their, their accomplishments up on the wall, you know, uh, their drawings and things like that, right? Children learn from activities that also seem like play. Children do learn from play. By the way, let me tell you something about children in general. When it comes to children, everything is learning, whether they're playing or they're reading or they're watching TV or they're playing on a tablet, it is all learning. It's all experience, all of it. And children like to learn by playing. It's a good thing if you can incorporate that, incorporate that in the curriculum. Teachers provide tasks that reflect cognitive eagerness of the child. They'll provide things that, where the child can learn language and learn you know, to put things in order, to use all their senses. They, don't, they won't just learn about, let's say, let's say about the, the food groups from just looking at a book, okay? The teacher will actually bring in things from the food group. Here's some eggs, some cheese, you know, some fruit, right? Some apples, some oranges. Here are some vegetables, the legumes, whatever it is. Some candy, right? And they'll talk about the food groups. And as they talk about them, the children will get to touch them and smell them and even taste them. Okay? So children learn by doing, by playing, by interacting. Those are child-centered programs. And here's some uh, more examples. I, stuff that I looked up that's not necessarily in your book. 
here's uh, the curriculum for uh, Montessori preschool and kindergarten, okay? So they have practical exercises where they teach children how to button their shirt, how to tie their shoes, how to clean house, how to clean up after themselves, right? Other activities, also teaching them manners. Manners is something they, they don't really teach now, you know, and parents sometimes complain that children don't have any manners. Usually the job of the parents to teach children good manners, but in these Montessori schools, they also do that as well. My mom complains that I don't have any manners. I actually, you know, I'm not very, I don't have very good manners. And I tell my mom, I say, mom, well, it's because of you, right? I say, well, don't they teach you that at school? No, they don't teach you that at school, right? But in these types of classes, at these types of schools, they will, okay? There's sensorial exercises where children use their sense of touch, feeling, taste, and smell to learn, right? Uh, math involves, you know, counting, addition, subtraction, multiplication. But by doing things, right, by looking at rods, beads, spindles, cubes, cards, counters, right, uh, physical things. That's how children learn math. That's how they understand math at first, right? Because math is abstract. Numbers are abstract. They're mental. And you have to teach children that they represent real things, and you teach them math in that way. Uh, English language, right? They learn to trace the letters, the sounds, play word games, match up words and pictures, phonics, word building, all that stuff. They learn a foreign language. They learn geography by having a globe and, you know, maybe looking at videos and looking at stuff online. Social studies, you know, learn about different cultures by looking at photographs, maps, stories, or even having a speaker from that culture come in. Music, art, right? Songs, crayons, paper, art supplies. Art, right, is very important. Something that's being cut out of many curriculums. When they cut the funding, they usually cut the art classes first, the music, the art classes, right? And then those teachers are the first ones to lose their jobs when money's tight. But art is very important. All that is it's all part of their learning. Um, other child center programs, there's the Reggio, Reggio Emilia approach, right? You can see the classroom and what it looks like there, right? Children are encouraged but not required to master skills such as writing and using tools early. So they don't try to force them to learn something. They, they encourage them. They try to have children learn at their own pace again. No large group instruction. You're not going to have 40 kids and one teacher and maybe an aide or something like that, like it is for public school. That's very harmful, by the way. It's just really bad to have classrooms that big for small children, right? Where they can't get individual attention, right? So small classrooms, okay? No formal lessons. Different children learn at different pace and they learn differently and they have different activities for different children. You know, a teacher and several aides and, uh, and children get a lot of individual attention. Uh, the school has a large central room, floor to ceiling windows, right? It's not like in public schools where they don't want you looking out the window and they cover those things up, right? Because it's distracting, but they have big windows and stuff like that. And they want you to look outside and they talk about things that are outside and they go outside. They learn by going outside and experiencing things out there. Big mirrors, lots of space, low teacher to child ratio, like I said, you know, you know, you don't want a big, you know, big, uh, like a big classroom filled with a bunch of kids and one teacher display children's artwork, all that stuff. Um, the good news is that in public education, they have incorporated a lot of these, a lot of these things in public education that they've learned, you know, um, that they've learned from. The further back in the past you go, the worse uh, education was, especially for little kids. Believe it or not, they would actually try to teach little kids in the past by having them all just sit there quietly and the teacher would just lecture and have them raise their hand when they have a question, just like they're in college. And that's not the way children learn. That's not good for young children. They don't have that long of an attention span. They need to do things by, they need to learn things by doing things, not just by talking about them, okay? Now, what we have with public education here in the US are teacher-directed programs. They stress academics that are taught by teachers to an entire class. It's usually a big class, a lot of students, right? For every teacher, it's, that's, be, that's due to lack of funding, okay? Not enough money for education. There's a formal structured curriculum, right? Where children have to learn letters on this week at this time and their words and they, they have language arts, they have math, um, they have you know, social studies or whatever it is. And there's a time, right? When they learn, there's a specific time throughout the day for each one of those subjects and they learn different things, different weeks and they have a whole plan. They have a big binder that says exactly what they have to teach on a given time, on a given day. That's how structured it is, okay? Um, let's see how we're doing on time. We're okay. 
Um, and uh, they also learn procedures, right? Um, they, have to, they learn to listen, to sit quietly, to follow the rules, right? You know, they learn reading, ra writing, arithmetic, uh, art, music. Uh, you know, like I said, that's not always emphasized, but children do learn in that way as well. Okay, um, I need to keep going. Okay. Um, I'm almost done. Okay, we're almost done. Okay, so let's talk about uh, early education. Okay, uh, a program called Head Start. That was, uh, there was a little bit of an interruption there. I mean, I was, you know, I, somebody else was trying to talk to me, but I'm recording right now. I can't really be talking about something else. Okay, but that's why you heard those pauses, those gaps. But Head Start was an early, uh, early education program where it was federally funded, the government, federal government provided a lot of money for kids who are poor and disadvantaged, minority children, right, that were behind and were at risk for failure and just not very good circumstances in general. Uh, the quality of programs like Head Start have been questioned. They've been said that, the, they said that the skills are, that kids do improve, but the improvement is temporary. And other research shows suggest that it might provide long-term benefits for children who are disadvantaged. Uh, nowadays, Head Start, if there is available, it's available to all kids, not just poor kids, not just minority children, but to everyone because all children can benefit from it. But the ones who benefit the most are the ones that, um, you know, the, that are disadvantaged. They're the ones who have the most to lose, so to speak. They're the ones who are behind and really need to catch up. To show uh, that early education could be useful, beneficial, there was a study done called the Cal Carolina Abecedarian Project. There were 111 children that were studied that were at risk for school failure. They were poor, a lot of hardship in their family. Uh, so high risk children, what they did is they assigned half of them to the treatment group. So, you know, three years of intensive, uh, you know, uh, learning, you know, cognitive skills, language, social skills, right? Um, and, uh, and preschool and stuff, uh, pre-reading, uh, pre-math, even before, you know, they, they get to, so, so they, they try to really get them early, right? To start teaching them early, okay? Um, the results show that uh, after this intensive program, uh, by the third year of treatment, um, the children in the program had higher IQ gains, right? They scored higher in IQ tests. By age 15, the groups that got the treatment, right, had a higher IQ. They still had a higher IQ. They had higher achievement scores in reading and math, right? Um, the control group that didn't get the program, uh, they were more likely to be twice more likely to end up to be in special ed, right? And 35% of the treatment group went on to college. Only 14% of the no treatment group went on to college. Okay, that is where we will stop. So I'm gonna stop recording.